Good morning, afternoon, or evening, and whatever you might be, and welcome to the turn from reactionary populism to a progressive alternative with Professor Jeffrey Sachs and Roberto Mangavira Unger. My name is Florencia Liberty. I'm the head of program and partnership at the SEG Academy, and we are truly delighted um, to present you with this three part webinar series to discuss the systemic and structural changes necessary to create a progressive future. These three series um, today stand on undivided, uh, what happened to socially social inclusive economic growth and progressive politics. Uh, the second will be losing and finding the way, the United States and Brazil, which will take place next Friday, um, 26 at the same time. And session three will be from now to an alternative, the missing project, and will take place the following Friday, 2nd of April at the same time as well. Um, as our global um, audience joins the webinar, I'd like to remind you um, that you will all be able to submit your questions in the Q&A um, uh, feature of the platform, and uh, they will be addressed by Professor Jeffrey Sachs and Roberto Mangavira Unger after their lecture during the Q&A session. Um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it um, to Professor Jeffrey Sachs uh, so he can get us started on the first uh, of these three sessions. Thank you so much, Jeff. Great, thank you, uh, Florencia. Uh, and uh, thanks to the SDG Academy for uh, hosting these three sessions. And uh, thanks to uh, my dear friend and uh, longtime colleague, Roberto Unger, for uh, conceiving uh, this series uh, and uh, inviting me to join him in a brainstorming on uh, what's happened to our world and uh, two countries that we're going to focus on in particular that have had very strange and difficult politics uh, in recent years, Brazil and the United States. Uh, but these are cases that uh, show larger patterns and challenges for our world. At various times uh, during the past 25 years, uh, when uh, the world has been strange and faced uh, important choices and crises, uh, Roberto Unger and I have uh, taught together uh, in a, a kind of dialectical approach where uh, we each uh, give presentations, uh, discuss uh, amongst ourselves, and then open it up to the class. Uh, this time we're opening it up to the world uh, class. Uh, we're uh, delighted that hundreds uh, from around the world will be participating in these three lectures. Let me give you a warm welcome. Our topic is uh, to find a, a path to uh, a progressive future. Uh, we'll define that along the way, uh, our own perceptions of that, uh, but it is uh, to find a path to a future that is socially inclusive, just, environmentally sustainable with the decent lives for, for all people. And both the uh, Professor Unger and I believe that we're not uh, on that course right now. Indeed, uh, in uh, the two countries that we'll focus on in Brazil and the US, uh, we are in outright crisis uh, in many uh, deep ways, crises of inequality, of social and political polarization, of uh, massive disruptions of uh, work, uh, of uh, innovations that are at once uh, promising, uh, but uh, also extremely uh, dangerous uh, and uh, that could be inclusive, but are actually exclusive uh, and building huge uh, uh, inequities of uh, power and wealth. We'll try to understand these uh, themes uh, in uh, both the, a general global perspective and also with the focus, especially in the next lecture and the one that follows on the two cases of Brazil and the United States. Today, we're going to discuss uh, the background, what happened to progressive policies? Uh, what is the dynamic uh, or what are the dynamics that are 
uh, the, the underlying forces shaping global developments and uh, national developments. I'm going to start with the about 20 minutes of a quick overview. Uh, it's uh, very quick because I want to cover uh, roughly 70 years of uh, the world scene. That is roughly from 1950 until today, uh, from uh, the period just after World War II until today, and make some broad observations. I'm going to have to even start uh, further back, uh, roughly 200 or 250 years ago at the start of the industrial era to tell the story, but it will be uh, very, uh, I, I hope, uh, quick to the point and useful for some background. So I'm going to uh, put uh, a, uh, a PowerPoint uh, on the screen for all of us uh, to look at. Uh, you're looking at an iconic uh, uh, picture of the steam engine, which uh, indeed will be uh, the uh, starting point for, uh, for discussion uh, for me. So today we want to talk about stagnant and divided, what happened to socially inclusive economic growth and progressive politics. And uh, I will start out with the steam engine. I'm, I'm an economist and I would say a, mostly a materialist, uh, believing that fundamental drivers of societal change have been technological to a remarkable extent, of course, ideas and institutions both uh, drive technological change and uh, use them in one way or another. Uh, so the interplay of ideas, power, technology uh, are all uh, deeply relevant. Uh, but without the technological changes, we would not have uh, the shape of the world that we have. And I regard the steam engine as the most decisive technological change uh, since agriculture, uh, because it created the industrial world. Uh, it unleashed a period of 220 years, roughly, of uh, dramatic economic change, what we measure as economic growth, and a world of profound inequalities as well, because some parts of the world harness the new technologies more effectively than others. Some parts of the world succumbed to power uh, from the early uh, industrializers and European imperial rule was one of the consequences of the uh, earlier industrialization that took place in Europe. Well, the steam engine changed everything about economic history. This is a well-known figure estimating world output over the two millennia. And not much happened in the world economy in aggregate production for 1800 of the 2000 years of the two millennia of the common era. Uh, suddenly the curve shoots upward and that starts around 1800. And I would argue, though I won't argue at length right now, that it started with the harnessing of coal energy which broke free of what historians call the organic economy, the kind of economy that was limited to animal traction uh, and human uh, labor and what could be uh, gained in energy from growing feed grains and food grains and a little bit of wind and, and uh, water power thrown into the mix. But the steam engine led to massive rapid economic growth for the first time in human history. Uh, but it led to hugely unequal development because industrialization itself started in England with the invention of the steam engine by James Watt and its commercialization with the ample coal reserves of England. It spread to Western Europe and to the United States in the first half of the 19th century there was no industrialization in the rest of the world until the late uh, 19th century. Japan was the first industrializing nation of Asia after the Meiji Restoration uh, in 1868, which put Japan on a path of industrialization. 
China not only did not industrialize, but it fell victim to European and then Japanese imperialism because it was a, a late industrializer, even though it was a leading civilization in most of human history. Uh, China did not industrialize. Britain began the effective conquest or dominance uh, over China in the first Opium Wars of 1839 to 1842. And then came the second Opium Wars and the Taiping Rebellion, uh, and then the increasing encroachments of power of the Western imperial powers, uh, then uh, the war with uh, Japan uh, in 1895. It was a long, bad, difficult history, but China did not industrialize until really after the founding of the People's Republic of China, uh, which was 1949. So we have a world that took off in industrialization, but remarkably unevenly. And that remarkable unevenness also led to the greatest <coughs> divergence in military power, as well as in economic power in human history. Uh, and gave Europe and then the United States uh, really the, the power to impose uh, it will on much of the rest of the world. That's the starting point for our world today. During the period from 1820 to 1950, the share of the world economy being produced outside of what I call the North Atlantic region, which is uh, Europe and the US. The share taking place in Latin America, in Asia and in Africa declined markedly. That's what's shown in this graph. Uh, the share outside of the North Atlantic fell from uh, about 65% in 1820 uh, to no more than 30% by the end of World War II. So this was the North Atlantic made industrial world, the North Atlantic imperial world. Uh, and the rest of the world uh, was mostly victim and assigned the role of providing the raw materials for the industrial North Atlantic world. Then came the two world wars and between 1947 and the 1970s, uh, essentially the end of colonialism almost everywhere. And that unleashed for the first time the possibility of economic growth in the former colonial regions. Uh, up until that time, they couldn't even implement education programs. It was only with independence from European power that uh, most of the rest of the world was able to begin a process of economic development. And what you see here is a huge historical change. Uh, that is starting around 1950, a process of convergence begins where technology spreads beyond the North Atlantic to the rest of the world. And most notably for our time, China began to catch up uh, dramatically with the rest of the world once it was freed from the yoke of uh, imperial controls. This was especially true after 1978 because the first decades of the People's Republic were tumultuous, but with 1978, uh, the end of a very difficult period of uh, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, Deng Xiaoping uh, created a framework of uh, governance that uh, enabled China to massively uh, increase uh, its uh, uh, productivity uh, in all spheres uh, and actually over a period of about 40 years to end extreme poverty in China, quite a remarkable accomplishment. But if you take a look at this U-shaped graph, for about 150 years of industrialization, the North Atlantic became more and more powerful. From 1950 onward, we've had a period of, uh, uh, of uh, convergence, broadly speaking, although again, very uneven, because different parts of the world have uh, uh, had different economic 
experiences. Now, I want to emphasize the underpinnings of this global growth, especially uh, from the 1950s onward, because I think it's key to this story of division, both within countries and between countries. Uh, starting with the Industrial Revolution, but especially with World War II and its aftermath, the economies of the leading countries became more and more science-based. And just as one indicator, I have here the share of research and development spending in the U.S. economy from 1953 to 2017, just a slide from the National Science Foundation. What you can see is the rising share of the national economy spent on uh, research and development. In fact, the red line is the research and development share of the private sector. Uh, the uh, yellow uh, curve and line is the R&D of the public sector. This has been to an important extent uh, a science-based economic growth spurred by public funding, but then taken by private business with massive uh, ownership and market capitalization of, uh, of, uh, inform of, uh, um, uh, of uh, information and technology uh, and uh, intellectual property rights. And that has been the basic driver of continued economic growth in the high income countries, science and technology based. And one of the implications of that is a massive change of the employment structure as well. Uh, what is shown here from 1950 to 2015 is the share of total jobs in four different classifications. The, the managerial and professional class, which is in blue, the production uh, workers, which is in agriculture, mining, construction, and manufacturing, and the jobs in services uh, and sales, uh, which are the lower two lines. The big change sociologically and economically in the United States, you can see, is the rise of the managerial and professional class and the relative decline of the production class. This, in my view, uh, speaking uh, very uh, briefly to this point, is the nature of science and technology-led development, that it is uh, congenial to certain kinds of work, uh, uh, those with high educational attainment and uh, particular professional skills that work alongside the machines. Whereas uh, this same technological development displaced much of the working class. And so the share of workers in production activities on the assembly line or in the mines or in agriculture or in construction declined from almost 60% of employment to one quarter of employment. Well, that's a huge gap that opened up economically between the professional class and the, uh, uh, the uh, producing occupations. Uh, mainly in construction, manufacturing, and primary commodities. It's also a sociological and political divide that opened up as well. What happened is that the demand in the marketplace measured as earnings of workers with bachelor's or higher degrees saw incomes rise during this period because the technological demands called for more and more of the professional skills, whereas the workers who were replaced by uh, the machines, the uh, workers uh, that uh, succumb to automation on the assembly line, now to e-commerce uh, and to uh, uh, autonomous uh, mining uh, and mechanization in agriculture, saw their wages decline. We have ended up, therefore, with a, a huge economic divide in our societies uh, that 
uh, has opened a, an unprecedented income inequality. Where does that income inequality come from? It comes in two ways. The owners of intellectual property, which are given monopoly rights by the patent system, uh, have uh, soared in wealth. Uh, and this uh, we have seen also during the COVID-19 pandemic, that uh, the wealth of the richest people in the world has gone up by trillions of dollars in the last two years, where as uh, the frontline workers in the brick and mortar economy have lost their jobs, lost their incomes, uh, and uh, suffered terrible declines of livelihoods. So there's been a huge shift of income towards intellectual property and towards professional workers, whereas uh, assembly line workers and uh, workers in the brick and mortar retail sector, uh, in agriculture, in mining, and so forth have seen uh, declining employment and stagnant or falling wages. When that inequality opens up, governments have choices. Uh, and, uh, or let me not put it that way. Let me say that political systems may or may not respond and or may respond in differing ways. Does that widening income inequality lead to a political response uh, to try to transfer income from the rich towards the poor, or does it lead to a political response that exacerbates the income inequality by giving even more political power to the rich and depriving the poor of uh, that margin of political power? Well, countries have differed markedly in that. In the United States, it has been the case that during this era of widening inequality that I believe is driven fundamentally by technological change, politics has weighed more and more on the side of the wealthy. So it's become more oligarchic, less democratic during this 40 year or 50 year or 60 year period, depending on your start date. And so we've had high inequality driven by technological change amplified by political change. Whereas in the social democratic countries of Northern Europe, it is fair to say that similar inequalities in the marketplace were met by resistance or offsetting forces politically of high levels of redistribution. The share of government in the economy rose markedly in the last 50 years in Northern Europe, not in the United States, for example. So the claim that I'm making is that change, even from 1800 onward, has been technologically paced. Of course, how that technological change feeds through to real lives depends on politics. For 150 years, industrialization led to misery outside of the industrial countries because it led to imperial power and imperial rule. That began to change after World War II. Within countries, the same technological change that became even more science-based after World War II favored a certain class. I'm privileged to be in that class, lucky to be in that class, because uh, workers like myself who have uh, PhDs have had a strong uh, labor market demand uh, and uh, the technological revolution has been uh, a friend, not a foe in that way. But many have suffered and our political structures have amplified that suffering in the United States, something that we will discuss and look at in, uh, in the next uh, lecture. Let me uh, just note in the end that the world has very different levels of inequality. This is a key question for us. Uh, the United States is not the most unequal uh, place in the world, but it is much less equal than Canada or in Western Europe, where you see the green shades, which means low inequality. The countries in red have the highest measured inequality, the highest Gini coefficients. Uh, and we can see that in general, uh, Brazil is, of course, among the most unequal uh, countries in the world. 
the United States the most unequal among the high income countries of the world. So let me stop by summarizing the main points uh, that I would like to put on the table as a background for our analysis. First, modern economic growth is driven by technological change. Uh, second, the North Atlantic countries industrialized first, and those countries actually hindered industrialization in the rest of the world through their imperial dominance. Catching up growth began after the end of imperial rule, which means after the end of World War II. Post-1950 growth worldwide has increasingly been science-based and education favored. The professional class as a result has soared in number and in income relative to the rest of society. Inequality has widened in all parts of the world, but has been partially offset by fiscal redistribution in the social democracies, not in the United States. Uh, and this uh, poses a major question of the relation of politics to economy, uh, a topic that we're going to be uh, discussing uh, in, in detail uh, in these three lectures. Let me stop there. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, turn it over to you, Roberto. <clears throat> this is a seminar about alternatives uh, in a world that is bent under the yoke of a dictatorship of no alternatives. For some time now in the rich North Atlantic world, there has been a dominant project of the enlightened elite. And that project can be described as a commitment to reconcile the economic flexibility that has been paramount in the United States with the social protection that has been emphasized in European social democracy. Within the framework of a barely adjusted version of the inherited and established institutions. It is my thesis in these discussions of ours that this project has failed and uh, it must be replaced by an attempt to change the framework. Uh, in this circumstance that I'm describing, the progressives, the would-be progressives, appear on the stage of history as the humanizers of the inevitable. Their main effort to be has been to place a human face on the program of their conservative adversaries, chiefly by resorting to compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer, progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements. The origin of this situation lies in the last major moment of institutional and ideological refoundation in the rich countries. What we could describe as the social liberal or social democratic settlement of the mid 20th century. The American counterpart to which was Roosevelt's New Deal. Under the terms of the settlement, the forces that were attempting earlier in the 20th century to reshape more fundamentally the arrangements of power and of production, renounced this challenge. And in return, the state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate the economy more intensively, to redistribute retrospectively through progressive taxes and social entitlements, and to manage the economy counter cyclically by fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, and this project has been carried uh, since the aftermath of the Second World War 
by the major center-right and center-left parties. Now it has failed. And it has failed in three main ways. First, it has failed to ensure the continuation of broad-based, socially inclusive economic growth. There was a period of 30 years after the Second World War of rapid and broad-based growth, but with few exceptions or interruptions, it has been followed by a slowdown of growth and of the rise of productivity. And a major reason for that slowdown has been, as I will discuss later, the emergence of a new vanguard of production that rather than being disseminated to the whole economy, has been quarantined, confined in islands that exclude the vast majority of businesses and of firms. The second way in which this program has failed is that it has failed adequately to attenuate inequality rooted in the hierarchical organization of the system of production. And in particular, in the deepening chasm between the vanguard and the rear guard, the insular advanced part of production and the vast economic periphery excluded from that, from that vanguard. Now it is true that the European social democracies have preserved relatively more equality than the United States. They have been relatively more successful in attenuating these inequalities, but with two important qualifications. The first qualification is that compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer has worked only as the epilogue to many decades of struggle in Europe over access to economic and political power. The epilogue doesn't work without the preceding narrative. And the second qualification is that if the disparities become too great, uh, they cannot be uh, contained by retrospective correction through tax and transfer. The correction would have to be massive uh, so massive that it would begin to disorganize the established economic incentives and arrangements and exact an unacceptable cost in economic efficiency and output. The third way in which this program has failed is that it has failed to ensure the conditions of social cohesion in the advanced societies. Money transfers organized by the state are not a sufficient social cement. They appear to be so long as there was ethnic and cultural homogeneity. But when ethnic and cultural homogeneity are eroded, for example, by migratory flows, the insufficiency of money as a basis of social cohesion becomes manifest. The consequence of this failure of the project of the center-right and center-left parties in the rich North Atlantic world has been the creation of a political vacuum. And into this vacuum has come reactionary populism. It enters the vacuum uh, the populist movements and leaders uh, have no organized mediation connection between themselves and the masses. It's a personalist, unorganized, liquid leadership. They give non-structural responses to structural problems, and they mask the insufficiency of these non-structural responses sometimes by exploiting the animosity 
of ethnic majorities against ethnic minorities, and sometimes by pretending to side with the cultural and religious agenda of the working class majority against the cultural preferences of the elites. But populism is also fragile. It has no economic program other than imposing constraints on migration and no constitutional program other than strengthening executive authority. So the vacuum continues. The right wing, the right of center or left of center establishment may come back to power, but it's likely to come back to power empty handed. It may have money to distribute, borrowing or printing it uh, for stimulus as in the emergency now, but it has no structural alternative. So that's our discussion in this seminar. Uh, how are we to find a way out of this vacuum, an alternative to both the established social liberal or social democratic program of the mid 20th century and the false populist response to its failure? Now, this brings me to a second story necessary to understand the failure that I've just described. And the second story is about a change in the practice of production. Until relatively recently, the most advanced practice of production used to be industrial mass production. The large scale production of standardized goods and services on the basis of rigid machines and production processes uh, with semi-skilled labor, and, rel and very hierarchical and specialized relations of production. That was the economic basis of the program that has failed. Uh, now there emerges in the world a new vanguard of production, which we call the knowledge or innovation economy. Uh, with, with an immense potential a potential to draw together the activities of production and of scientific discovery, a potential to raise the level of discretionary initiative and reciprocal trust required and allowed of all participants in the process of production, and the potential to loosen or even reverse what up to now has been the most universal constant in economic life, diminishing marginal returns to inputs in production. There is the promise of a form of innovation that is perpetual rather than episodic. Uh, but this potential is constrained because the new vanguard of production, although it appears in every sector of the economy, in intellectually dense services and in scientific agriculture, as well as in advanced manufacture, appears in each of them only as a fringe, excluding the vast preponderance of workers and of businesses. The consequences of this insularity are far reaching. The first consequence is stagnation, slowdown. How could there not be slowdown if the most advanced practice is denied to the largest part of the economy? If most people remain stuck in what is in effect make work in relatively retrograde forms of production. And the second consequence is the aggravation of inequality. An inequality anchored in these structural divisions in this abyss that opens up between the advanced and backward parts of production. An inequality so great that redistribution by taxes and entitlements is insufficient to master it. 
There then appears in the world a new dilemma about economic growth and development. The old path to rapid growth was conventional industry. That path is now closed. The former vanguard survives only as the residue of an earlier form of production or as the satellite to a new vanguard. But what would be the alternative? The alternative would be an inclusive form of the knowledge economy, a knowledge economy for the many, but it doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist even in the most advanced economies with the most educated populations, how could we expect it to exist in the rest of the world? That is the dilemma that we must break. And we can break it only on the second side by transforming the seemingly impossible task of developing an inclusive knowledge economy into a feasible one, breaking it up into steps and pieces. Now then we come to the agenda, the outline, the sketch of a path that would enable us to respond to this vacuum and to this failure and to find an alternative that would reestablish the basis for socially inclusive economic growth throughout the world. Anticipating the course of our discussion, uh, I suggest that there are three main lines of institutional innovation to explore. The first line is democratizing the market economy to the end of disseminating throughout the labor force and the production system, the most advanced productive practice, the knowledge economy for the many that I invoked. There is no single natural and necessary form of the market order. It is not enough to regulate the market or to compensate for its inequalities by retrospective correction. It is necessary to innovate in the institutional arrangements that define the market order. And we can imagine the, this innovation as advancing in three steps. In the first step, the objective is to expand access to the resources and opportunities of production in favor of the mass of backward firms and of relatively unequipped workers. And to discover what works and to disseminate what works. In the second step, we can imagine the beginnings of a new institutional architecture of the market order between governments and firms, a form of strategic coordination or partnership that is decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. And among firms, cooperative competition, so that even as they can continue to compete against one another, they can also cooperate, achieving economies of scale. And then in the third stage, much further ahead, the creation of alternative regimes of private and social property that coexist experimentally in the same market order. The market order should not be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself. The second axis of such a structural alternative is the development of a high energy democracy. A democracy that does not need crisis to make change possible. A high energy democracy is a democracy that first elevates the tempo of politics, the temperature of politics, that is the level of organized popular engagement in political life through the, the form of the electoral regime, the relation between money and politics, the access 
to the means of mass communication in favor of the political parties and the social movements. In the second place, it is a democracy that accelerates the pace of politics, its tempo, by creating constitutional mechanisms that resolve impasse quickly and distinguishing the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, which we should uphold, from the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics, which we should repudiate. And the third set of institutional arrangements of a high energy democracy have to do with the combination of strong central initiative and radical devolution to parts of the country or the society so that they can experiment with counter models of the national future. A high energy democracy is the indispensable counterpart to a democratized market order. The third axis is to secure the individual, worker and citizen in a haven of safeguards and capability ensuring endowments. So that all around him, there can rage a storm of innovation and experiment. The most important part of that haven is a new form of education, a form of education, both general and technical, that accords priority to the analytic and synthetic capabilities of the mind over the mastery of dead information, that prefers selective depth to encyclopedic superficiality, that puts cooperation in teaching and learning in the place of the juxtaposition of authoritarianism and individualism in the classroom, and that approaches every subject dialectically from contrasting points of view, the only way to liberate the mind. Now, what are the forces that can drive such an alternative and help overthrow the dictatorship of no alternatives? First, success in solving the practical problems that the established program has left unsolved. The problems of growth, of inequality, and of cohesion. Improving the life chances of the masses of ordinary men and women. Down below, in the harsh realities of the world, the driving force is the struggle of states for power and prosperity. And up above, there is a spiritual ideal, the most powerful ideal at work in the world today, the enhancement of agency, the ability of the ordinary man and woman to stand up and turn the tables against his or her social circumstance. The enabling condition of the enhancement of agency, of this ideal, is the most important resource in the world. The formless, measureless life that exists in ordinary humanity. Vitality is almost everything, but it is blind and needs an ally to give it eyes. The ally of vitality is the imagination. Jeff, I turn it back to you. You were muted. Thank you very much. That is the uh, most frequent uh, sentence in the English language. Uh, now you are muted. <laughs> so I am off, uh, off mute and uh, really eager to engage. I think that uh, probably uh, a major question is the nature of this failure that uh, we, uh, of which we share a conception for the United States, for example. And the question is, uh, how generalized is that failure? Uh, 
what does it mean about uh, social democracy, for example, which I uh, continue to uh, admire and espouse, albeit in, in an updated uh, form for the 21st century. Uh, I don't want to idealize any society, but I would say that what we see in uh, the uh, countries uh, of Scandinavia today, uh, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, or the Nordic societies, including Finland and Iceland, have a, a great deal of what you call for of uh, growth, uh, equality, and inclusion. And it is notable that in those countries, life is socially uh, inclusive, Life expectancy is in the 80s, uh, the highest in the world. Uh, leisure time is shared broadly. Uh, everybody gets uh, many, many weeks of leisure time, which is extremely important for well being and for replenishment of uh, body and soul. And I think it's not right to say that the idea of social democracy is merely compensatory tax and transfer, though that plays a role. The idea of social democracy, as I understand it, is inclusion, including precisely the kinds of investments universally that uh, you espouse and that I uh, concur in education and in healthcare uh, and in the other kinds of uh, uh, security uh, and, and rights that you properly call for is the third plank of uh, the, the future. So I think one issue which we can discuss is the extent to which this failure is a pervasive failure or a particular kind of failure. I regard it much more as a US failure and of other societies as well but I see features in US culture and society that brought about the end of uh, the New Deal consensus or the social democratic consensus that were distinctive to the United States and not uh, a fundamental failure of the social democratic uh, ideal itself. Of course, uh, social democracy was uh, born in the late 1800s, and it took root in the 1930s. And it uh, was uh, born in the industrial world, not in the post-industrial world. And so there uh, are important questions about how a 21st century vision of social democratic inclusion uh, should be updated to take into account very different sociologies and structures of our society. And uh, I like many of the suggestions you make and uh, will discuss them uh, about uh, how knowledge and education uh, can be more, uh, uh, more attuned to uh, our, our real needs and our possibilities. But I, I believe that what we're looking at in uh, the U.S. and in Brazil, when we look at it, and in some other countries, is a different set of issues from the ones that you have focused on, which are uh, overwhelmingly uh, on, on the theory of the economic roots. Though you did say that the failure of social cohesion came about because of ethnic, uh, the required, that the success required ethnic and cultural cohesion, uh, and it was uh, that stress that brought it uh, apart. And there, I think uh, you're putting your finger on something that we need to discuss a lot more. Because to my mind, the history of the United States needs to be understood fundamentally uh, in, in the uh, context of civil rights uh, and in the context of uh, very deep longstanding racism and how that more than anything else derailed the New Deal. 
because I think that the great dividing line in American politics was not the economic failures of the New Deal, but was the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Because the civil rights movement of the 1960s meant that the New Deal would be expanded to the African American population in the United States. And that proved to be unacceptable to the hard racist half of American society. And that to my mind is the battle that we continue to fight today. So I think that Trump was something more than an empty populist, uh, a demagogue, and as far as I'm concerned, a psychopath. Uh, but I think what he was actually was a familiar voice in American politics, uh, which is the racist uh, tribune uh, of uh, a racist part of American society who was promising that it would not be the African-Americans and the immigrants and the Muslims uh, and uh, the Asians who would be the beneficiaries uh, of government. And it was a standard ploy of this part of American society from slavery onward to say we dismantle the central state so that local power can restore white dominance and that was the story after this, that was the story before the Civil War, the story after the Civil War, uh, the reason that Ronald Reagan endorsed states' rights uh, in 1980, and the motivating factor of Trump. So where I would put the hardest part for society is living together in multi-ethnic, multicultural, multiracial societies. Uh, and having indeed the social democratic ethos, which is an ethos of inclusivity, uh, an ethos of shared capabilities, uh, an ethos of redistribution also as necessary, but not focusing so much on compensatory redistribution as universal inclusion and empowerment, how to do that in societies that are totally warped by the history of conquest, uh, the legacy of slavery, which in the United States was followed by apartheid rule for a hundred years, and then by backlash against uh, the civil rights uh, legislation of the 1950s and the 1960s. So to summarize, I don't view social democracy as a, uh, as a failure. Uh, but I view it as a challenge. Uh, and the biggest challenge is uh, mentality uh, of uh, how diverse societies can have a social democratic ethos, can have an inclusive ethos, can even aspire to uh, the kind of inclusion uh, that you uh, are absolutely rightly calling for. Other smaller points, I don't believe myself, though this is uh, uh, that th this is, uh, I, I think, uh, finer points to debate. That our biggest problem is lack of innovation uh, or stagnation of uh, of innovation. We're we're actually in the midst, of course, of a revolution of innovation. Th there are problems to be sure, and the two major problems uh, that you rightly pointed to is innovation, even by design and sometimes by accident can result in monopolization. And second, innovation does not necessarily diffuse. Uh, and the diffusion of innovation, I agree with you, requires a different kind of education uh, as a fundamental point. And the monopoly issue really requires us to rethink the patent system and the way the innovation system works and the capture of knowledge by small groups by design and to some extent by the forces of network uh, scale because all of the digital technologies have uh, network uh, externalities that lead to winner take all kinds of structures to them that are detrimental to our well-being in the end. 
But I don't think that we fundamentally are stuck in innovation. I also do wonder uh, about, uh, I, I very much agree, uh, by the way, with the idea of the security of the individual in the midst of the storm. And I think that that is the social democratic uh, genius, actually, which is people feel secure even in a fast changing economy, which is a rather remarkable feature. But in the United States, if you lose your job, you lose your health care, you can lose your home, you can lose everything. And that doesn't happen in a social democratic uh, regime. So maybe I'll uh, pause here to say that I, I think what you are calling general features have a lot of historical specificities to them, but they are widespread features uh, of uh, highly divided societies. And they have a lot of racial backlash to them uh, in a world that is not homogeneous and should not be homogeneous and never has been homogeneous, but was white dominated for uh, a lot of modern history. And there I do see a fundamental question which we need to confront. So Jeff, there are too many themes there to address. So I'm going to choose just uh, three, three parts of your remarks to comment on briefly. So first, the universality of the dilemma about the next model of growth. Uh, it's not just about the rich North Atlantic world, it's about the whole world. So take my country, which will be one of our two major examples next week, Brazil. Uh, we had conventional industry established in the Southeast of the country in the mid 20th century. Uh, and as generally in the world, it is in decline. It won't come back. Uh, now we found a refuge in the riches of nature. So we uh, uh, export uh, now chiefly to China, untransformed agricultural and ranching products and untran untransformed mining products. And uh, this easy wealth from nature pays the bills of urban consumption. Uh, that's not a national future. Now, what's the alternative? The alternative would be the thing that doesn't exist, the inclusive knowledge economy. Uh, it, it exists only as this set of islands that I described. So somehow we have to find a way to lift up step by step this vast backward periphery of the economic order. Without that, all of the dynamism of the Brazilian people will go to waste. Now, my second observation about historical social democracy, a theme which you and I have discussed before, let's have an unsentimental view of social democracy. So uh, historically, there were three sets of arrangements. First, there were arrangements that defended the insiders against the outsiders, like insider workers against workers with unstable jobs. Second, there were arrangements that organized social compacts or incomes policies, deals between big business and organized labor orchestrated by the state. And third, there were the, the high level of redistributive entitlements paradoxically funded by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. Now what's happened? What's happened is that social democracy has been progressively hollowed out and it's given up the first two sets of arrangements and retreated to the last line of defense, the high social entitlements. And it has been quote liberalized, especially in, in, in the labor markets. Uh, uh, with an increasing part of the labor force consigned to precarious and stable employment. That's the reality. Uh, and the, these forces of hierarchical segmentation and inequality are advancing there also in the home ground of European historical social democracy. It's no good for, um, pro for American progressives to imagine a, a mythical Sweden of the 1970s as, a, as the answer to their problems. Uh, it's mythical because based on 
many decades of struggle over economic and political power that ended in a compromise between the social democratic states and the plutocratic dynasties that continue to own most of the Swedish economy. That's the reality. We don't need to sentimentalize it. And it is not able to master this new agenda. Uh, it has a great achievement, the high level of investment in people and their capabilities, but it doesn't have answers to these structural problems. Now, the third theme, nationalism, unity, cohesion. All the nations in the world are on a path from having been tribes to one or another extent to becoming something else, experiments in different ways of being human. And along that path, an accident happens. They have to give up parts of their collective identity, their customs, they have to imitate one another. And then the abstract will to difference is aroused as actual difference diminishes. So two nations live side by side and they hate each other, not because they're different, but because they're becoming alike and they want to be different. So what's the solution? The solution of liberal cosmopolitanism is to suppress difference. The real solution is to equip difference, to create the basis to generate new differences, new innovations. And that's the program that I began to outline. And that program is related to something internal to the societies. How do we establish cohesion if cohesion can't rely on sameness? The alternative basis for cohesion is doing things together, the multiplication of forms of collective action. And that's what we want in both the democratized market order and in a high energy democracy. I, I agree with you uh, on uh, the idea of equipping difference. I do uh, remind all of us uh, that when that kind of empowerment was politically on the table in the United States, uh, we had a decade of assassinations of leaders who called for exactly that uh, with Malcolm X, uh, and Medgar Evers and Martin Luther King uh, and others who were advocating exactly that. The particular path of racism uh, in the United States, but also uh, not only in the United States, and I'd like to understand more about Brazil because Brazil was the largest slave owning society, the last to end slavery. Uh, it uh, has had a somewhat different trajectory, but I my feeling is that the legacies are still very current and very strong today. The vulgarity of Bolsonaro uh, in the way he speaks about the indigenous peoples also is something absolutely startling. Uh, and to my mind, out of the 16th century, not out of the 21st century. But I think the point I would emphasize is that you are absolutely correct. And I think for all of us, uh, we are in, uh, uh, we, we are in trajectories of change in a truly global world. Uh, I tend to believe in cosmopolitanism uh, as uh, important. I tend to believe in difference also as something to celebrate and to equip. So I like that idea very much. But I also want to emphasize how much resistance there is in practice and how decisive that was actually in the American context, because we did not have a good faith debate in the United States about equipping difference. We had violence. And the more one uh, is reminded or learns or relearns about American history, the uglier is this underpinning uh, of American history. I'm in the process of finishing uh, uh, one of the great classics, which I had never read before, uh, W.E.B. Uh, Du Bois uh, Black Reconstruction, uh, which is a, a monumental achievement of a genius uh, describing uh, how the Civil War end of Reconstruction ended up in the effective re-enslavement of African-Americans in the United States. 
But what is striking to me, Roberto, is the unbelievable vulgarity and violence attached to it. There was not an ounce of good faith uh, in uh, the much of the U.S. Uh, to protecting African Americans after a civil war uh, that had emancipated uh, slaves. And the legacy of that was an apartheid society. And my claim is that that was also the doom of social democracy in the United States. As Du Bois says, already back in the 1870s, because poor blacks and poor whites could not get together to see themselves part of the same, uh, same class and same society, but also in the 1960s and onward, because we didn't have a good faith attempt to equip difference. We had a, an attempt to crush difference once again. So I think that this is part of our very deep difficulties and we should think about how to, uh, how, how to uh, address them. Uh, on uh, mythical Sweden, I'm probably more for mythical Copenhagen than I am for mythical Stockholm, I have to tell you. Uh, Sweden became, I wouldn't say conservative, but definitely it lost uh, some of the social democratic uh, uh, ethos and charm, I would say, in the last 30 years. Like you say, it, uh, it, it took on a lot of things that I would not have recommended. Uh, still compared to the US, it's uh, incredible. But I would say in general, it, it, it is not the case that it's mere uh, sentimentality. These are really uh, nice places to live with a high quality of life, very broadly shared. And I think we should uh, appreciate that point. Jeff, I think we, it would be good to open up now, right? Yes. Absolutely. Right, yes. And please respond to any of that. So I didn't mean to crowd the conversation, but uh, we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff and Roberto, for such a comprehensive lecture and on this progressive alternative covering everything from political, economic, education, social issues, and so on. Um, uh, we've been monitoring uh, their very, very vibrant comments and, and questions and a really interesting conversation from our um, participants, uh, you have touched many of these items uh, covering slavery, colonialism, racism, education, technology, and so on. But I will pick some of these interesting um, questions and please continue uh, to, to comment on, on, on our um, Q&A. So um, this question comes from Joel Rogers and, uh, uh, and it says, uh, what is your view on the promise of urbanization? Another huge trend in the world as a promising way to reconcile this perspective that you're putting on the table. The promise of what could, could you- uh, Urbanization. Uh, urbanization, yeah. All right, and, and the more, a more progressive uh, project going forward. Uh, particularly because cities are more, uh, as, as we know, more productive and more tolerant and um, a natural place to construct high quality uh, public goods for residents, uh, he said, and more a better environment. And he hopes that we will be more mindful metro, metro sapiens uh, you know, having a better, uh, live, living better together, but also with nature. Jeff, would you like to begin there? I, I'll just say a, a, a word. I think uh, it, it's a very good question because the urban milieu really is a, itself a, a shaper of our souls. Uh, and it is a fundamental uh, global trend at the start uh, of the Industrial Revolution, when the steam engine first uh, came uh, to being the share of uh, the world living in urban areas was less than 10%. Uh, and now it's estimated at 55% and uh, rising to 70 or 80%. It's not sufficient, obviously. Brazil and the US are highly urban societies and uh, have not overcome the challenges. And, Brazilian cities are famous for having a very sharp a geographic dividing line that one can see from the sky, uh, and so too uh, American cities. I would say that uh, a lot of our history of the suburban phenomenon in the United States in the 1950s onward is literally the phenomenon of racism in action uh, in uh, the institutions of housing and residential settlement because American suburbs were designed for white people and they were financed for white people. Uh, until 1968, the uh, Federal Home uh, Administration, FHA, 
would only give mortgages to white people and it blocked developments for mixed or for African-American uh, uh, populations. So we actually designed a geography of segregation as a core matter of public policy, even in a favored New Deal program. Uh, and that's why I say the 1960s was so decisive because when the FHA said, okay, we're gonna open this up for everybody, then the racist part of American society said, then we don't want this uh, program anymore. And that's when the backlash to the federal government became so powerful. So, I, so this problem of urban planning illustrates a, a difficulty of method that is pervasive in these programmatic discussions that we are beginning here to have. And the difficulty of method is this. It, 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 it doesn't make sense to imagine that there'll be a single national, much less worldwide blueprint for urban planning. We have to be able to experiment. Uh, in generally with respect to all of these structural problems. So like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we have reason to recognize the primacy of structural alternatives, but unlike them, we also have reason to resist entrusting our future to dogmatic institutional formulas. So therefore the state needs to be able to experiment the state can't experiment just centrally. Different parts of society of the country have to be able to experiment separately to get off the train and to try something else. Now, we know from history that any kind of devolution of power can readily be abused to entrench privilege of some groups of the population against others. Therefore, the devolution has to be qualified or constrained both politically and judicially to ensure they will not be abused in this way, but it is indispensable. Uh, and uh, as opposed to the early 20th century progressivist vision that there is an enlightened technocracy that decides how cities ought to look and then imposes that on the whole country. That's absurd. So we, the, the, the problem is that we recognize intellectually that it's absurd, but we don't have the institutional machinery to escape from dogma and we need it. Thank you so much for that. There are a lot of questions regarding education as well and both as educators, I'm sure you have a lot to say. Just to give you a bit of the context, um, many people have mentioned STEM education as a very important aspect, but then others have noted that actually it's more education for e e equity and, um, and you know, what type of affordable uh, quality and universal education is, is right. So I was um, interested perhaps that um, you could say exactly this, right? What is so that why education? So why don't I begin there and answering that and I'll say, thinking about the two countries we've chosen as examples, Brazil and the United States. In any society that's very large, very unequal and federal in structure as Brazil and the United States are, uh, the, the threshold practical problem is how to reconcile the local management of the schools by the states and towns with national standards of investment and quality. So we need three mechanisms. We need to know what works to, to, to measure results and performance. Uh, second, we need to have redistributive mechanisms to redistribute resources and staff within the Federation. It is intolerable for the finance of the school system to depend on local finance exclusively. And third, we need a corrective procedure. If a local school system fails, uh, it has to be taken over by a, co a cooperation within the Federation to fix it and return it fixed. We cannot allow the quality of education the young person receives to depend on the happenstance of where it's born or to whom it's born. Now, that's on the side of the institutional setting, but then there's the, the pedagogic paradigm 
which I briefly pointed to, uh, uh, a, a different kind of education. Now, uh, we, we have it episodically. In the United States, there was an educational reformer, John Dewey. There's an elite part of the school system that goes somewhat in the direction that I described. But then there's a whole second layer, this, this vast educational dualism in the United States. We need something completely different uh, and, and, and much more radical than what we have. Uh, so, uh, the, the national curriculums that exist in the world are for the most part a kind of infantilization of the university culture. So, you know, in the university, uh, there are these disciplines and each of them is based on the marriage of a method and a subject matter. So for example, economics is not the study of the economy as you might think it would be. It's the study of a method pioneered by the marginalist theoreticians at the end of the 19th century. And so the national curriculums take this backward to the education of children and try to induce them to, to mistake the dominant ideas for the way things are. So what do we want? We want a form of education that from the very beginning insulates them against intellectual servility so that they are not delivered, emasculated to the higher stages of education. Uh, and that's a project, that's a program of national liberation to, from, from the very beginning to form an education for the entire population, not just for some polished elite that liberates the mind so that they can stand up so that they can move in the context and move against the context. That's liberation. And educational liberation is the indispensable counterpart to economic and political liberation. Let me, let me also add that I, I think that technology exactly like our course right now could be part of this liberation because we really have the means for uh, to, to reach people in new ways and much more inclusive ways and much lower cost ways also than in the past. And so we should be thinking about how uh, the, the online world can be transformative uh, and empowering and accessible uh, in, uh, in very new ways. I'm convinced that it's key for a massive upscaling of our part of uh, our corner of education, which is higher education, uh, where the costs of a university degree are unimaginable uh, in, in uh, many uh, of our brick and mortar campuses, but the same uh, kind of access and training at a 50th of the cost is possible through using the new technology. So I think we can be more open, more inclusive, more global, uh, like our classroom today, which is a global classroom, uh, people participating from all over the world, gives us an opportunity for doing something different. I also agree completely. We find in the areas of issues like climate change, where we need first of all, lots of solutions and lots of local action. There is no curriculum in almost all countries in the world that equip uh, young people to become active and uh, problem solvers in this crucial area. And this is a fantastic area, not only because there are basic crucial uh, parts of knowledge that should be known and mastered, but also because problem solving is intrinsic to this challenge and every city uh, should be solving problems. Every village should be solving problems on climate change. And I envision students marching with their solutions to the mayor who doesn't know, uh, but to say, this is what we should be doing locally. So I do see ways to uh, uh, do uh, what you're calling for in a new kind of pedagogy. And I would add both the substance area, learning about the big uh, challenges that we face, whether it's climate change, inequality, 
uh, or uh, global citizenship, living together in uh, tolerance, and participatory uh, learning, which is very different from the normal learning, but I think can be uh, enhanced really by a, a new technology, a new platform, or new platforms for education. So in this area, we're, uh, I think, completely eye to eye on uh, the need for breakthroughs. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say that here there is also a lot of comment around patents and, and, and also the open source movement. That's way that we can be more inclusive and exactly what you're saying, the use of technology. So this is great. We do have a couple of minutes and I just wanted to perhaps um, bring another uh, item that has been um, a, a recurring one, which is sustainable development. And perhaps the, the, um, in this initial session, we're going to dive in more of these questions going on. And I'm glad that we have two more sessions to go. Um, if you could elaborate a bit more in the, in the link of this uh, progressive project and sustainable development in general and the SDGs in particular. To the link to what? To the sustainable development goals. The sustainable development, yep. yeah. So do you want to say something first? Yeah, yeah, let, let, let me say a word about that. The, the ethos of sustainable development is that society should be prosperous, inclusive, and environmentally sustainable. So I think it is uh, very much aligned with what we are discussing. Sustainable development as a set of goals uh, specifically adds uh, a an emphasis on the environmental catastrophe that is unfolding. Uh, and it's very much a part of our discussion for Brazil and the United States coming up because it's not coincidental that both countries uh, do not uh, exactly incorporate the norms of uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, and in fact, both uh, have resorted to uh, what Professor Unger called uh, uh, I don't remember exactly the phrase that you used, but uh, the, the stopgap of uh, turning to nature uh, as the salvation uh, when other things failed. The uh, refuge. Yeah, the refuge. So plundering yeah. the Amazon or plundering yeah. uh, our, uh, our nature. So we will uh, absolutely uh, come back to these uh, themes uh, in, in the next lecture. Yeah, so let me make just two, two brief comments uh, about this, this this very large subject. So the first is that uh, a sustainable form of production is either primitive or very advanced. There's nothing in between. And that fact is often not appreciated. So a, a Green New Deal, a project of sustainable growth is inseparable from the agenda of deepening and disseminating the knowledge economy. The second comment is this, there is a tendency within the rich North Atlantic world to represent ecological politics, environmental, the environmental agenda as a kind of post-structural or post-ideological form of political activity. And the premise is this, history has disappointed us, all these calamities of the 20th century, so we will we will drown our sorrows in the great garden of nature, like a park. Uh, but that's not how we should think of this theme of sustainability, not as a, a way out from the struggles over structure, uh, but as an invitation to retake them and reimagine them in another form. And that is very concretely presented, for example, in the Amazon, in, in my country. We have 25 million people living and working there. It's not going to be a park. Uh, and so we have to have a different way of, of understanding the relation between the urban industrial technological complex and the green complex in a form that ensures that the forest standing will be worth more than the forest cut down. And then there's a whole world to develop of technological links between the, the urban and the forest, of technical links, the environmental services, of economic links, the intermediate stages, and of 
legal links, property regimes that will allow us to manage that vast territory larger than Western Europe uh, by some means other than just conceding the land to large businesses. So this is a large task of invention. It's not a diversion into a theme park. It's part of the reconstruction of society. Wonderful. Thank you, Florencia, so guide us to our next session together. Absolutely. Yeah, we're at the end of the hour, uh, but we're lucky that we have two more sessions uh, on the 26th next week, as well as on the 2nd of April. So please um, stay with us. Uh, you will receive at the uh, end of the webinar a link uh, with the recordings. They're both going to be, they're going to be both at the uh, YouTube channel uh, of SCSN as well as the SCT Academy Library, and the link to register for the next two sessions. Thank you so much again, um, Professor Sachs and, and Roberto Mangavega Unger for such a wonderful class and, and for sharing this um, so your valuable expertise on such an important and current topic. And thanks everyone. Thanks so much to our audience for, for staying with us. Thank you all. Thank you and see you next week. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>